This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcast that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode number 102. Oi! Don't be scared. All of this is new to you and new can be scary. When people need help, I never refuse. There's this moment when you're sure you're about to die, and then you're born. I know exactly who I am. I'm the doctor. Ta-da! Ooh. Should be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the latest episode of Doctor Who for, with the 13th Doctor. It's called It Takes You Away. And joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Good. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, folks, remember to uh, go to our Facebook page at the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and like the show there to, to like the page and then to find this episode and like it there uh, to reshare it to your friends, to retweet it on Twitter. Leave us comments. Uh, some Give us that feedback. Subscribe in if you don't yet subscribe to the podcast, do so in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app, or even on YouTube where we post the show as an audio only video. And if you do subscribe there, make sure to hit the bell to get notifications when we post a new episode. All this is in service of uh, sharing the podcast to grow our the audience, um, share it with your friends, especially those who like Dark to Who, um, and help the community grow. And uh, we can reach more more folks with this. Uh, Jimmy, uh, do you have a word for us on the uh, SQPN giving campaign very quickly? Yeah. So we're in the second half of our giving campaign now. We're over the hump, uh, at least in terms of time. As people know, we haven't run a giving campaign in two years. And so our funds are depleted and we really need to hear from people. We launched a whole bunch of new podcasts, including uh, Secrets of Star Trek, Let's Talk, and Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. We Stepped out in faith that uh, once we launched these and people saw the quality of them, that they would respond by supporting them. And we need them to do that because without uh, your generosity, we won't be able to keep doing them. And this is the time we need to hear from you. Uh, We're going to be making decisions at the end of our planning campaign based on the responses we get. And we're most of the way through now. People have been responding, but frankly, not enough. Uh, We're not where we need to be. We need to hear from more folks. So please go to sqpn.com slash give, G-I-V-E, and become one of our regular supporters or make a one-time donation. Uh, But we particularly appreciate uh, people who are able to support us monthly on Patreon. We have some wonderful thank you gifts we'd like to send you. But it is very important that we hear from you right now because we're not where we need to be and we need to get there. So we're uh, in December. It's Advent. We're coming up on Christmas, which is the anniversary of God's greatest gift to us, his own son. So please respond in a spirit of giving by going to sqpn.com slash give and helping support the podcast that you love. Thank you, Jimmy. So today's episode uh, that we're discussing, uh, like I said, is It Takes You Away. It's the penultimate episode for this season of Doctor Who. And uh, it, uh, as a recap, um, this is the, uh, I think this is the official recap. In an isolated house in the Norwegian fjords, a scared girl hides alone, waiting for her father to return. In the distance, a monster comes to take people away. And for some reason, one mirror is not working as it should. The 13th Doctor and her friends must battle their own desires to work out what is going on. So that's the uh, the thrilling uh, recap of this episode. Okay. So uh, we fairly we, accurate. Yes, yes. Uh, it doesn't tell you everything, and just gives you a little a little glimpse of what Chris, it's about. 
Of course, this was a video. I hear the word fjords, and my immediately thought is the okay. parrot pining for the fjords, pining for the fjords, <laughs> or Slarty Bartfast saying how he 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 thinks fjords gives gives a continent a a lovely rococo feel, and he wants to do Africa in them now. But people are objecting. <laughs> okay, now you have to explain for everyone what that what that is. That's from the Hitchhiker's Guide Hitchhiker's. to the Galaxy. Okay. By good. by the way, I, I happened to see yesterday as I was flipping through that Hulu has the the old nineteen eighties era. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, BBC Hitchhiker's Guide mini series. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. So <laughs> uh, that's a so classic. That is a classic. So, uh, so we we are in the present day. The Doctor mm-hmm. uh, b- clearly uh, knows that it's uh, 2018 as they land, um, and yeah. by tasting and, the dirt, tells us let's say in the Norwegian fjords. I, I like and and much more than that. Like twenty five kilometers away, there's an alpaca farm with a gift shop with a very low rating on TripAdvisor. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I liked the dirt tasting thing. It, I thought it was fun. It, you know, we've previously had Matt Smith like smelling things and announcing right. the the location, and so I thought the tasting thing was nice. Um, this episode is sort of you know how Doctor Who episodes kind of fall into patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, or certain subgenres, like we have the space opera genre, like the Saranga Conundrum. Uh, we have the historical, like the Witch Finders, and we have modern day ones. But this is a sort of different kind of modern day one. It's really the closest thing I can remember se- remember seeing on Doctor Who recently to a standard horror movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There are lots of horror movies. Um, you know, out there that are, you know, low budget, set in a remote location, slow build of creepiness. And um, and this really had a horror movie vibe. I mean, there's not blood and gore in it. It's mm-hmm. children's television. But uh, of all of the Doctor Who's I've seen recently, this had the most horror movie vibe. And I kind of yeah. like that. It was a nice change. Yeah, it's kind of kind of the classic creepy monster. Something's going to get you type. Episode, but you're not. Which, you see a lot not of even classic who as well. You see a lot yeah. of that mm-hmm. too. But yeah, you know, it actually is a new genre of of literature and and uh, and, and movies out there called uh, Nordic noir, which I think like Girl in the Dragon Tattoo and mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff oh. is part of. And so this was I kept seeing reference to this as being sort of Nordic noir and that like the so it, know, kind of kind of the counter to Pippi Longstocking. Yeah, very much so. Uh, <laughs> the the I, opposite of. Admittedly, I have to li- I have to admit I would love other than you know all the boarding up and the creepy monster sounds and everything. I would love to have that cabin. That was a <laughs> pretty nice place <laughs> looking there. I, yeah, exactly. A big cabin. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the the doctor also makes a reference early on to the she sees a sheep in the woods and and says, "Oh, in 193 years, will be the woolly rebellion when the sheep uh, rise up and renegotiate." Uh, in a bloody manner, the uh, relationship between humans and and uh, sheep. <laughs> yeah, so be careful in the year twenty two eleven. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I loved how she sc- saw the sheep and immediately scanned it with the sonic, and I thought, "Oh, is there? Are they going to pay this off as sheep could be monsters?" And then they did, yep. and I thought that was really fun. Yes, yes. I in fact, I thought the monster in the woods was going to be uh, the turned out to be the sheep, sheep, but uh, I guess not. Uh, one thing that uh, kind of bugged me uh, right off the bat is like, oh, it's winter. Uh, I'm sorry, but there is no way that was winter in the northern fjords no. near the Arctic I, Circle. I, I, I know. I had that in my notes, too. A cottage, a cottage in Norway in the middle of the winter and there's no smoke coming out of the chimney? What's wrong here? And I'm going, dude, this is Norway. This has to be like July. <laughs> exactly. I was gonna, yeah. If, if you want to see what Norway looks like in winter, I'll, I can point my camera at out my window and you will see the amount <laughs> yeah. of blinding white. Exactly. That's what it would look like. Right. Yeah. Ferns, moss, no snow, no winter clothes. That is. Uh, and she yeah, actually looked quite beautiful. It was probably yes. like 70 degrees and sunny, right. you know, when they filmed this. But. Well, and she made to she did say it's at the frilly part up top. I mean, it's not even you can't even like uh, you pretend that it was southern Norway. No, this is the mm-hmm. Arctic Circle, Norway. So uh, anyway, they uh, so they they go to the cottage and then it's all boarded up like a DIY gone bad, as they say. Um, and then they just go in like maybe someone's in there who doesn't want people to come in. Like maybe someone's at home and doesn't want to be disturbed. They live in the middle of nowhere, in Norway. Well, this this <laughs> they, is the doctor. They, Don't interfere until the doctor decides it's time to interfere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they could have had a knocking scene, but 
you yeah. know, it would have slowed things down. And if if uh, if Hana had actually come to the door and opened it for them, we wouldn't have had the creepy scene of them walking around inside looking at stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, finding her in the uh, cupboard and uh, uh, Graham's remark about uh, someone says, oh, there must be kids here. There are kids shoes. And. Graham's remark, or maybe she's a creep who collects kids' shoes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a uh, scary thought. How Somebody does she collect them? Movies. That's the scary part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the, they, so they find Hannah in the uh, in the cupboard, and she's hungry. They, they had found candy wrappers. And so Graham offers her a, a cheese and pickle sandwich that he just keeps in his pocket because, you know, it, as Graham, as practical as he is, well, there's you know there's plenty of times when we're we, we we don't get to stop for lunch, which is a throwback, by the way, to Rosa, if you remember, mm-hmm. where he yep. was talking about it. when are we stopping for lunch at some point here? So <laughs> exactly. Um, and then and this is when uh, when we find out that Hannah is actually blind. Um, she mm-hmm. she can't see. Uh, she's and um and I'm I think the actress herself is blind. If yes, I, if yeah. I, saw I looked it up. Uh, Ellie Walwork was her name. And she was actually blind from birth. So that okay. wasn't a put on that the yeah. way she was acting. That's, yeah. and that's I lo- natural. I, lo- I liked seeing them use a blind actress in the role. As soon as I saw the way she moved and the way she used her face um, yes. and so forth, I knew she's really blind. Yeah. And, and I did confirm it by looking it up, but I could just tell she's she is actually blind. I have known blind people and they I've even been legally blind myself. Uh, the men in my family get cataracts crazy early in life. And so I had cataracts in both eyes and spent some time legally blind. Wow. And it really does give, it gave me a whole new perspective on, you know, like verses in the Bible talking about the blind leading the blind, because I was having to be led around by people. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, so it was really neat to see a blind actress portraying a blind person, because whenever they have a sighted person portraying a blind person, they don't move the same way. Right. Um, now, in some cases, like um, Wait Until Dark with Audrey Hepburn, she's playing a woman who's just gone blind. So she is um, she still moves a lot like a sighted person, mm-hmm. but with some modifications. But someone who's been born blind, there's a naturalness to their movements and how like when you saw uh, Hannah check her watch and mm-hmm. things like that, oh, and yeah, then the she- way she the way she uses her eyelids and the way her eyes move. It's, it's very much, it was very clear to me, this is a real blind person. And I mm-hmm. like seeing that it's more realistic. Right. It makes, it makes the way that, that, that it's portrayed feel r- more real. Real. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there's this interesting moment when Hannah's telling them like what's going on, uh, where she says her, you know, her dad is missing. He was taken away. You know, it takes you away. Yep. And, um, Ryan kind of jumps in and just assumes the dad has run off. And, and, yeah. he, and we, and we kind of say, Oh, that's just Ryan's, you know, own baggage from his own dad running off. And he's just, you know, it, being it mean is, about it. but he was right. But he yeah. was right. <laughs> exactly. It is his baggage from his, the issues with his dad is how his dad took off, but it turns out in the end he was vindicated. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and so meanwhile, they hear this, this noise outside of this monster, and uh, the the doctor and Yaz go to investigate the monster while the uh, the, the two guys are looking around in, you know, they are sent to watch from inside the house, which is a interesting little turnaround from the usual where the guys go and confront the monster. Um, oh, but, I didn't even that didn't, didn't even occur to me. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's yeah. that I thought it was interesting, but I but the, I think it was a, it was intentional because you needed to get Ryan and Graham um, into this next situation, this next scene. Right. Um, they had to do it there. And which is that they find a mirror without a reflection. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Really creeped I, out. I love the line. If we were vampires, we'd know, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, that was, that was a good, a good, uh, a good. Uh, well, and I then, like the little little jump scare that Graham gets when Ryan comes up behind him. He doesn't realize <laughs> he's there. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then, uh, and then the the doctor and Yaz come uh, come in, and uh, they the doctor decides to go through the portal. She's taking. Um, Graham with her and Yaz, and they leave Ryan with Hannah. And I'm like, why? Are they, why are they leaving Ryan with Hannah? Why is why aren't they taking Ryan along? But uh, but again, well, we need he, him to be is, with her. Except for his uh, 
muscular coordination issue, he is, you know, young and strong. So if you yeah. wanted to leave mm -hmm. someone, one person to stay back and watch for danger to protect her, he would be a logical choice. That's true. If you, they're still thinking that the uh, that there's the monster is still out there. Yeah. Um, on, on the other hand, Yaz has police combat training. She would be a good one to leave, too. Right. 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 Um, although, you know, not knowing what's on the other side, you might want to split them up and have one strong mm -hmm. young yeah. person on each side. So. Uh, so and then uh, so they they go through into this cave like space and encounter. Oh no no! Before before we go there, okay. Um, the doctor oh. takes yeah. the chalk and writes on the wall and says, "This is a map of the house, pointing out its vulnerabilities." And and she and and um, what she's really written is a message. It's not a map. Yep. Uh, and we see it. Uh, and it says, assume her father is dead, stay and guard her, see if you can find who else can protect her. And and as soon as she wrote that, I said, Hannah is totally going to nail this. Yes. That she's going to know this is not a map because that did yep. not sound like drawing a map. That <laughs> sounded like writing. Right. Yep. And Hannah, as a blind person, is going to pick up on that. And she did. Yes, that was yep. a, that was very and, good. And it doesn't help much that Ryan is a terrible liar, too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she's constantly calling him, you're lying to me, you're lying to me, you're lying to me, you're lying to me. Because, well, he was and he wasn't doing a very good job of it. <laughs> right. Well, and so remember rule number one, the doctor lies. So, yep. yes, yes. So um, so now we move on to this next side. And, and just to kind of to kind of sum up this first act, uh, I think it, they did a good job of setting the the you know creating the setting setting up a misdirection because we mm -hmm. you know we think there's a monster and that's somehow responsible for what this and you know what's coming later on um and then we have this whole you know like uh uh hot, you know scary house with a blind girl in it i mean it, it's to it's total classic horror story um and now we move into this next act the second act of the thing which is um they the doctor and yaz and graham go into this anti zone and I have to say uh, that I felt like this middle part of the sh of the show was kind of a waste. I I I I didn't I didn't really like it very well. I I, I thought they they were trying to shove way too much into one episode. Like uh, so, they encountered uh, this alien creature. His name is Ribbons. Ribbons of of the seven stomachs. Right. Who's apparently always very hungry. I think. Um, that's like, all a metaphor, though. Yeah. Um, he I mean, whenever he talks about hunger and food, he's really talking about information and trading information. Yes. He, yes. He's, he's basically like a, a even more evil Ferengi. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. And then uh, the uh, the the flesh eating moths, uh, which mm -hmm. also inhabit that space. And there are rats. But we don't really you know who is Ribbons? You know, he dies almost, you know, very quickly. And. He doesn't even know where he comes from. He's like, I've always been here in this anti-zone, right. which the doctor eventually explains is a space created wherever the universe, the fabric of the universe is under huge threat. And yeah. it keeps so, worlds apart. Yeah. It, it. So the way she explains it, the universe, whenever part of its fabric is under some kind of extreme threat, the universe creates an anti-zone as a buffer between its fabric and the source of the threat. And so I, I, I don't know why they didn't say this in the script, but OK, so an anti-zone is a blister. That's exactly yeah, what a blister right. is. When your body is being when your flesh is under threat, your body creates a blister as a buffer yeah. between the sensitive flesh and the source of the irritation. Right. And so I thought, cool, a kind of a universal blister. That's yeah, a kind of an right. interesting idea. It, See, it, one, one, one thought I had, too, was uh it almost had a parallel to the gateway between E space and N space back in the fourth doctor time when they mm -hmm. were, they had the E space Saga. season and then they had the, the gateway between them where Romana and K9 eventually stayed right in that kind of limbo. Okay. Right. And it was kind of a, kind yeah. of a parallel to that, although a bit more severe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. how else you would put it, but it, it's also a kind of a wood between the worlds. Right, uh, right. You know, that's a standard trope. Whenever you have, <clears throat> two very different locations, like different worlds. I mean, you can have people just teleport between them, but also narratively, you can have some kind of journey between them. And that's like what in the they Chronicles, were doing here. Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it sort of also reminded me a little bit of the uh, the 10th Doctor uh, stories where um, he he and Rose and, and Mickey traveled through the void to the parallel Earth where uh, they saw Rose's parents. Oh, and, 
in their Cybermen. And, and the Vortex mm -hmm. itself is a kind of parallel that we see all the time in Doctor Who right. between right. spaces they right. go to. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. The Time Vortex itself. So it's 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 a it's a fairly common theme, I guess. It's a the, the, mm -hmm. that we've seen before. Um, so w was was your concern with it more that it wasn't executed well? Um, yeah. That you thought it kind of dragged. Yeah. Well, yeah. Narratively, it felt like uh, that it it didn't actually pay off. So you know, at first, it's this place that's dark and and we can't find our way, and the doctor runs a, a string to keep track of where she's going. Um, and they encounter ribbons, and he they have to trick him or or bargain with him to show them the way. Um, and eventually, and he cuts the string, and they're lost. Eventually, by the end of this, they're running mm -hmm. back and forth between portals with no problem. I mean, right. Ryan and 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 Hana, who who's blind, like make their way pretty readily between the between the portals. And, well, and apparently yeah. Eric made his way through this space without any danger. And I just feel like well, what's the, what's the point of this to the entire story? So, I mean, obviously to fill airtime, but <laughs> right. And 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 I think to increase the creep factor and the uh the sense of danger and unexpectedness. I mean, I I I would defend this by saying it is more interesting and more creepy when you go through the mirror to have this other completely foreign environment that you right. don't know how to navigate yeah. rather than immediately stepping into the parallel universe. And right. it, it turns out this place is basically like a fairly straightforward corridor between the two worlds, but they don't know that at first. Ribbons right. is deliberately misdirecting them and because he wants the sonic screwdriver. And um, he he even says when they're when he's dealing with one of the flesh moths, um, which for people who haven't seen the episode are kind of carnivorous moths that will eat flesh, but not clothes. And yeah. they're like sky piranhas only yeah. uh, or at least the way piranhas are depicted in film. They're not actually that dangerous in real life. But um, but they're basically flying piranhas. And he says he throws it some meat and he says, uh, luckily, everything can be distracted with a little bit of food. And as soon as he said that, given the food equals knowledge metaphor mm -hmm. that that he's been using, I said, OK, he's going to be he he is or is going to be distracting the doctor and the companions with a promise of knowledge that's not going to pay yeah. off. And then that's exactly what happened yeah. because he said he would lead them to Eric and, um, and, and he's really just running a scam to get the sonic screwdriver. So he's using the promise of knowledge of Eric as a way of getting what he wants. Okay. But um, they don't know that this is a straightforward corridor. Only ribbons knows that. And he's trying to scam them. And and all that is is fine. I mean, I, I don't have like a, a strong visceral dis, you know, dislike. I mean, it doesn't. I still like the episode, but be, because we 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 don't. One of the things that we lose by having this extended stay in the anti zone and 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 all this is, you know, we we don't. By the end of the episode, I'm gonna, I guess I have to kind of skip ahead a little bit. We have this, you know, thing going on between Eric and Trina and Graham and Grace and the. Doctor and the Solar Tract, and we don't have time to really develop that, especially since, you know, we've got this. The Doctor claims to, you know, may have made a friend of the Solar Tract. Well, I never got that because that there was no time to develop that relationship. Right. I, I hmm. didn't believe it in that sense, and so I'm like, well, if they'd if they'd kind of got rid of some of this and just mm -hmm. had and added time to the Solar Tract, I felt like that would have been a better use of the time. That's all. I, I mean, I still yeah. like the episode and, I, I and overall, that. but yeah, I I, I, I can I, see that. But and I I, I like the, the 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 anti zone part. I thought it I thought it was a, a well done section. But I can also see that argument of where maybe they could have shortened up that. And right. yeah, but I, I'd have to rewatch the episode again with that in mind. But I didn't have a problem with it. I thought that no. the I thought that the solid track sequence. I, I got what was happening there. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel particularly rushed to me, um, but I could rewatch it with that in mind. Um, by the way, one thing I wanted to note about the uh, anti-zone sequence is like, what is up with the doctor threatening to kill ribbons with the Sonic? I mean, she's pointing yeah. it. I mean, he's ribbons is threatening Graham. 
Right. And she then points the sonic at his head and says, you don't want to do that because you don't want those to be your last words. So she's threatening to right. kill Ribbons with the sonic. And we've never seen the sonic kill a person before. So and and normally, I mean, she's using it like a gun effectively. Yeah. And we know yeah. how anti-gun the doctor is. So she's either bluffing. I think bluffing is what I got. Yeah. But I, I but even it's... even then she's she's gun bluffing. And yeah. that's a little out of character. I did get I did get flashes from the 50th anniversary episode of what's with pointing the Sonics? What are you going to do? <laughs> Screw it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> screw it into that. I can't remember the exact phrase, but yeah. you know, where the war doctor is just looking at the two of them going, what are you doing? <laughs> yes. You're going to just unscrew it. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, so I think way, I thought it was bluffing, but yeah. Okay. And, and, and that occurred to me. I just, I thought it was odd. Yeah. Also, I love though, once the doctor has realized that ribbons is, is not on their side and he tells them when the flesh, flesh moth swarm shows up, he tells him, run back for your doorway, get out of here. And the doctor instantly says he wants us to run, so stay completely still. Yeah. Right. Because that's what's going to protect you from the moths. So he was going to stay completely still and let them run and attract the moths. Right. right. And the doctor, I just love the cleverness of that. Nope, do yeah. the opposite. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and then Graham, I love Graham. You know, Ribs is going to try to take off with the Sonic, and Graham just body tackles him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Action, Graham. So, um, yeah. So they, uh, I want to go back to Ryan and Hanna back yeah, in, the, in, yeah. in no Norway. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan discovers that the monster noise is actually coming from a speaker outside, which yeah. which uh, Hanna would not have been able to discover because she can't see. Um, it, well, she might have, but right. I mean, she could have like followed the. Cause it's got to be plugged into something. If she followed well, a speaker it. cord, she could have found the speaker. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If she'd found but, the cord and 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 guessed at what it was, or was wondering what it was. Right. Um, they uh, and, and meanwhile, um, Hannah, he, Brian has prevented Hannah from going through the mirror because she's discovered it and locked the door and taken the key. And so she she knocks out Ryan with the, with uh, whacking him in the head with the door. And they've got a nice yeah. nod on his head the rest of the episode. Yeah, I, I like how it's Ryan's mistrustful behavior towards Hannah yep. that causes her to turn on him. Yes, because I mean, if I'm in my house and someone is dragging me around and locking me in rooms, you can bet I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to retaliate against this guy and rec reclaim control over the situation. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what Hannah does. Right. If he had been more reasonable with her, she might have cooperated with him. Yes. Right. And in fact, I like that they make a point out of, you know, when someone is blind, you don't grab them and drag them around. That's that's very rude. Uh, I mean, it's rude at, at, in, in you don't normal do it to time. anybody. But yeah. but especially for a blind person, you know, just like you guide a blind person by offering your arm or your elbow and, and they follow yep. you that way. Um, it, it's that's just good manners. And I like that they make a point out of that, that Ryan, you know, sort of violates the, the proper behavior by doing that. Um, so, you know, Hannah goes through the portal into the anti zone uh, and then Ryan will follow her. Meanwhile, um, ribbons having been eaten by the moths, the doctor and Graham and Yaz. They go to what they think is the portal back to the world and end up at the wrong portal and go through and end up in a reverse dimension. Now, I'm not sure everybody noticed this. I want to make sure that yes. people realize that when they filmed this, they flipped mm -hmm. the yeah. image. So every like yep. everything is backwards. The the right. the t shirt. The Eric's most obvious. Yeah. Yeah. The most obvious example is Eric. When we meet the father, he's wearing a Slayer T-shirt for yep. the musical group Slayer, but it's reversed. And yep. then when they finally get back to the regular universe, it's now the correct way around. Right. So, yeah, they flipped the images. And I think it was they're, they're the, on the other side of the and, looking and, glass. And, yeah. and they didn't make a point of it. I liked it was just a nice, subtle thing in there. If you were paying attention, it's a lanyard for you to notice. Well, but they didn't like hit the 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 the, uh, the nail on the head. And they did. Just, they did put a clue out there, though, because uh, was it Yaz that said, did they? Rearrange things? Yes, when as they go through. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, in fact, and so the doctor's um, hair is parted on the other side. She's reaching into the other pocket for the Sonic. You know, all those things. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's true. It, and it's interesting to, 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 to watch it that way. Uh, and if, you know, so rewatch it if you haven't, if you didn't notice it, just rewatch that part at least. Uh, and and I, wonder if, I wonder if they just simply, you know, they filmed it normal and then just did a digital. Yeah. Yes. That's 180 what they did. on it. They you know, flipped it in Instead of post. trying to reverse everything, you know. Yeah. 
which is got to like drive the, uh, the, the editor crazy because all instincts are to say, don't do this. <laughs> Like, you yeah. know, like it's got to be like ingrained into a video, into a TV editor to not do that. Uh, so very funny. Now, uh, so the doctor and, and Yas and Graham, they, they find Eric in the house and they confront him. Uh, Eric has been has been coming to this place and now has stayed in this place because he, have fo- he has found his deceased wife, Dead wife, Trina, mm-hmm. somehow alive on this side of the of the portal. Yeah. Um, and she remembers dying and she so. She is his wife, yes. but she can't leave this space. And so yep. he's he wants to stay with her, but he needs to take care of Hana. And he keeps delaying going back to Hana right. yes. in case he can't get back here. So which I thought was very human. It's very human, but oh, yeah. as Graham points out, he's a big jerk. <laughs> he is a big jerk. Exactly. Yeah. Because he's abandoned his poor blind daughter and is terrorizing his daughter with this monster so that she doesn't wander off. Like, yeah, that's Yaz horrible. Has, Yaz has a line about shocking bit of parenting, referring yeah. to the, the monster spoofing. Well, it was, it was, and it was it's good like, the doctor, it was good the doctor was there because if if Yaz didn't get there first, Graham would have knocked knocked <laughs> yeah. him out. Yes. Yeah. Both of them I, were ready to slug him. I, I like, uh, I mean, Eric does care about his daughter. He says she's a teenager and she's got food in the freezer, so she'll be fine. <clears throat> so he knows her basic needs are met. But the the whole monster thing is just wrong and broken. Yes. And Hana yeah. points that out at the end. She says, you you haven't been right since mom died. Yes. And which is also very human. I understand that, mm-hmm. um, you know, people, including parents, can get broken through a mm-hmm. horrible tragedy like that. Um, I liked uh, that they hung a lantern on the whole absurdity of the monster thing when um, when Ryan just said, why didn't he just get you Wi-Fi? <laughs> right, you know, right, yeah. for a teenager, keep the teenager in the house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then what? Oh, go ahead. One thing they one thing they did with 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 Hannah and uh, Trini is the Hannah mentioned that the shirt she was wearing was her mom's, and of course, right. then her mom in the alternate universe was wearing that shirt. Yes, uh-huh. yes. Which someone pointed out uh, uh, was a uh, production uh, error because the the band. Um, the concert that she's wearing the shirt for that band, I think the Attic Monkeys it was or something like that. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, was it the wrong t- year? Blah, blah, blah. Something, you know, you know how just, fans are. Just, just ripples mm-hmm. from the time war. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's the, the, the standard Doctor Who disclaimer. Uh, yep. So, uh, and then of course, where there is one uh, deceased wife who's come back, we now have two because of course, Grace is there. And, yep. um, She's like it, Trina, doesn't know what's going on. And immediately I said, okay, is Graham going to leave? That's going to be the big question. Yes, mm-hmm. that was the, for, for me, me too. And, and what, well, actually, the other thing that came up to me as, as things went on is uh, we, rem- we had, you and I, Jimmy, had just recorded uh, this coming week's episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where the question is, mm-hmm. are we living in a simulation? And if, it, if we are, does it matter? And I'm thinking, right. huh, are Grace and Trina simulations? Yeah. <laughs> so, folks, if you uh, go subscribe to Jimmy Akins of Serious World and listen to that episode coming up this Friday, that's a, that's a little preview. Um, but uh, so th- now we get the uh, this wonderful moment where we where we see Bradley Walsh acting his heart out. I mean, this is so, mm-hmm. I I felt like this was the high point of the episode right here, um, mm-hmm. where Bradley Walsh is the husband who is torn, who's confused, um, who doesn't know what to think or feel. And, and I really felt like that was, I, I mean, my, personally, I felt like that he did such a great job here. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and this is, I think where the writing was best of this episode was in, in this part of it um, with, with Graham and grace. Um, and it was, I like grace. It was nice to see her again. Yeah. again. Um, yep. So, and it, it was nice to entertain the possibility. Is this really her? Can right. these, you know, can right. these be them after they died somehow brought to this parallel universe? And, and what would that be like from Graham's perspective? You know, mm-hmm. if you, it, you, cause part of you is really going to hope, you know, mm-hmm. that, that this is, this is her and you're together again. Yep. And, and let me say it right now. If this were Stephen Moffat's uh, show still, it would really it would be, be Grace. Grace. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, because Moffat does not like killing off his characters. Um, so 
now we get, but then we get this this next thing where the doctor comes up with this explanation. Now, let me ask you guys who are more long time Doctor Who uh, aficionados. This is all new. It's all okay. It's all new. That's that yeah. was my question. Um, we have this whole big new mythology about the origins of the mm-hmm. universe, which is on top of all the other mythology that the Doctor has well, as, previously yeah, given us. Say, the, the 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 before time era, before there was the universe was apparently a very busy time because there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of stuff that happened before time. Right. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. One has to take the before time either as a metaphor or you have to take the era of time as just meaning our era. Right. 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 Because otherwise there would have been no time for the solid track to break everything. Right. Exactly. It's very, it's yeah, it's, it's all wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Yeah. So what we get, so you got to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's the other standard Doctor Who explanation. Solid track kept the universe from forming because our universe can't work with solid track energy present. The solid track is both a consciousness and energy. It's a conscious universe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, n- not the strongest premise for me, frankly. I mean, it's. Uh-huh. And in fact, I kind of come back to this idea that it feels like sci-fi written by someone who isn't a sci-fi aficionado. Now, I don't the 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 the, the screenwriter hmm. is uh, was it Himes? Um, Ed Heim. Ed Himes. I was going to say Eric, but that's a character. Ed Heim. And I don't know what his his uh, resume is on uh, science fiction, but I feel like I some, think this is it. Yeah, I feel mm-hmm. like sometimes people who come in to write sci-fi who aren't normally sci-fi writers have this idea of what sci-fi is. And, mm-hmm. and they think it's this, like we create giant mythologies and throw all this stuff at it. And it's very confusing and all these high concepts and we go. And I'm like, it, that, it, no, <laughs> I didn't have a problem with this. Okay. Um, conceptually, because when you're talking about stuff, that's really fundamental <clears throat> um, metaphor has to play a role and you're going to have weird collisions Whenever you're talking about fundamental stuff, I mean, you just study quantum mechanics. It's a wave and a particle. Right. You know, you're going to have these weird collisions. And so it didn't bother me to say it's a consciousness and it's kind of a universe and it's a fundamental element of reality that interferes with other elements' abilities to interact. What it sounded like to me, and this may be because I'm coming at it as a, you know, scholar of religion, but it sounded like Gnosticism. Yeah, this sounded mm-hmm. like a Gnostic myth about because in 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 uh, Gnostics would say, OK, there there's this hierarchy of different fundamental beings that, uh, you know, semi divine beings. And at least one of them is broken and interferes with the ability of other things to work together correctly. And and so I kind of mapped it onto that. OK. And kind of right. onto physics paradoxes and i didn't have a problem with it okay uh, okay i mean i and i can i can accept that i mean it's there there's sci-fi where the with you know that is complex and and i and maybe that's what this is and and, and i'll go with it because there's different levels of sci-fi there's space opera like you mentioned before and this is more high concept um but it kind of feeds into something else that i've heard some fans say you know fans can say all kinds of things it doesn't make it true but some mm-hmm. people said that they feel like this season of Doctor Who, it feels like they took the basic premise of Doctor Who, you know, uh, a Time Lord who travels in a box with companions to different times and places and created a whole a show relatively unconnected to everything that preceded. So we yeah, don't I have any of this. That was, yeah. Chris, when you listen to what Chris Chimnall had to say before the season aired, yeah. that was kind of part of his intention. Right was to kind of, you know, because we, we've been talking about throughout as we've been doing this, these episodes for the season of, well, what's where's the story arc? Well, he said there's no story arc and we haven't seen really a story arc. Are these going to be returning characters? We haven't seen any returning characters. Are there going to be old characters coming in? There haven't been any old characters. Right. He really has wanted to make it a renewal with just the basic of you've got the Time Lord from Gallifrey in the blue box mm-hmm. with companions, et cetera, et cetera. A- you know, and just I don't a very, have a very I- basic. Yeah, and I don't have a problem with that as I mean eventually it will reintegrate. But I as saying, you know, we're going to we're going to do a lot of new stuff. We're not just going to keep going back to the same old well. The show had become very continuity heavy. Yeah. and mythology heavy in the Stephen Moffat era and this was a returning the show to the, to its roots. It feels in term on a certain level, it feels much more like 
Doctor Who originally was back in 1963, yeah. where mm -hmm. you had these more standalone story arcs. You didn't have big, huge arcs connecting them. You had a what felt like a fresh slate um, yeah. with lots of new stuff being introduced. And it's not just, oh, here are the Daleks again, and here are the Cybermen again. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a, a problem with that. I was actually surprised at how much referencing of previous Doctor stuff there is. In this one, for example, um, Coming up, we yeah. have reversed the polarity. Yes, that was yeah, nice. Exactly. Pure third Doctor. Yeah, that was nice to see uh, See that come in. You're speaking uh, my language. Is even, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. Um, okay. What would, have been, what would have been even better is if Yaz said, yeah, I saw that on Star Trek. <laughs> oh, yeah. I saw, or I saw that. Or, no, they wouldn't just say Star Trek. Was, I saw that on a science fiction show once. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. they've, they've, refer, they've referenced Star Trek before on Doctor Who. Yeah. Oh, have they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rose at it. one point tells Christopher Eccleston's doctor that he's, oh, that's he's right. not really Spock. he's not really Spock. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he's not Spock enough. That's right. Um so as in the explanation that the doctor gives about uh, her bedtime story that her, one of her grandmas told her uh, one of her mm -hmm. seven grandmas. She says she had seven grandmas and her favorite was the fifth. Um now again folks this is uh, <laughs> Gallifreyan so all... we reminded our aliens. Yeah. It's all new. Yep. Also. Yes. Yeah. And uh, th this was a bedtime story. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, no. when I, yeah, only let's, when I couldn't sleep. Let, <laughs> let, me, let me toss. Let me toss this out to you, though. Okay, so seven grandmothers, seven classic doctors. Could Tris Chimnall be saying that uh, Peter Davison is his favorite classic doctor? Hmm. The seventh doctor. In, in that case, Patrick Troughton might be an agent for the Zygons. <laughs> yeah, right. What was that about when the Zygons were first introduced? Uh, that was Fourth Doctor. Mm. Fourth, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm being kind of silly on this one, but the, that yeah. is that is good though. That's funny. That's my my fifth grandma. I didn't think of that. Uh, so uh, we, the Doctor says the our universe exiled the Solitract to a separate plane of existence uh, as a conscious universe in order to to save itself, and then the, our universe could begin to develop its laws of physics and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, we, so we have the, the exposition, uh, part of the episode, which is, you know, it's always a part. Um, yeah. So, uh, we, we have Ryan and Hannah, we're back to them. They're running, you know, the, well, one of the things we're told is, is the, because the doctor and, and company have entered into the solid tract plane of existence, um, they're destabilizing it. Um, right. Mm -hmm. They're, they're causing the two worlds to come too close together and they're going to destroy uh, both, right? Is this a, uh, yeah. both, which is yep. now we're back to we have to save the universe sort of stuff yeah though they don't hit they they don't play that a great deal yeah. it's more like we can't stay here right. and they only briefly allude to it being a to it destroying our universe okay. um, but it makes sense I mean the whole reason the solid track got exiled in the first place was because it couldn't integrate with regular matter. And right. so it's, it's, it makes sense that this is going to progressively cause problems if there, if there's not a radical separation. And so they think at, for a while, maybe one person can survive in the solid track universe without it causing a problem. But even that proves not to be the case. And mm -hmm. that's fine because that was embedded in the initial premise to begin with. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So, and then we have uh, Ryan and Hannah who they, somehow know that they need to run from the death moths uh, and running from them. So we have that uh, interlude and then they come through into the uh, solid tract plane and Hana encounters Trina, her, her mom, but immediately rejects her saying this, this isn't right. That's not her. And it's it sort yeah. of, um, uh, that's kind of a trope. I, I don't know how it, how close to reality is, but there's sort of a trope whenever blind people are in um, TV shows they somehow have like extra sensory abilities. They are their their other senses are enhanced, and I've heard some mm -hmm. people who have uh, re, you know uh, sensory issues, uh, you know blindness or deafness, who have said that's not exactly what, that's not what it's exactly like. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I'm glad. I mean, that kind of came out in one line where the doc. I don't know if they were. I mean, I agree on looking at it. You can draw the inference that. Hana is somehow preternaturally perceptive because of her blindness. I mean, that's a trope that goes back to <clears throat> to the Greeks. 
right, where you right. had blind blind prophets. You you lose like Tiresias, you lose your sight and you gain prophecy. Right. Mm -hmm. Um but um but I didn't take it that way. I mean the because I I would just assume if I'm Hana and I and I've I know my mom is dead. I'm just being a realist. Yeah. That right. You're not her. Whatever you are, there's all this weird stuff happening. You're not her. And and having that kind of rejection, even if it turned out she was wrong and it was her, it would still be a natural first thought right. for someone well, to have. And 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 then um the doctor says this thing which I think was a a dialogue flaw because she she implies to Eric that he should be able to sense that this is not her. He says, Hana right. senses it. Why can't you? Right. And, and I thought, no, you haven't. Nobody but Hana senses it. Right. Well, um, you've but, deduced it. That's not the same yeah. thing. There is a line from Graham later, um, right before the end, where he says, you're not Grace. Real Grace had, paraphrasing, real Grace had more joy. And I think what that's kind of hinting at is and what Hannah noticed is that the solar solid tracks portrayal of these people were good, was good, but it wasn't perfect. Right. And there right. was flaws. And I, I think that's kind of what the doctor was getting at. What Hannah noticed is mm -hmm. you're this person is not my mom. She does not act like her. And ultimately, because the solid tract is manipulated, this is, you know, a classic plot of desperately loved person tries to trap others into a situation where they can be loved. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen that a lot. And that's what the solid tract is doing here. But because that's its overarching goal, it ends up making mistakes, which yeah. is another trope in this kind of story, uh, like not sending Graham back for Ryan. Right. Exactly. And in fact, we get these interesting moments where the solid tract, as soon as someone rejects um, the solid tract and, you know, figures out what it's really doing. It sort of, you know, uses the force to shoot them yeah. back through the. Yeah. Force, the, force them pushes out. them off the island. Right. What I found interesting with that is, you know, it pushes Hana through. It pushes Eric through, pushes Graham through. But the doctor has all along been rejecting the solid tract. Why didn't it eject the doctor first? I, I, feel, I mean, like it couldn't be for the story purposes, but it, I mm. feel like that's sort of a well, little flaw in the narrative. I, I would my, my guess would be the solid track knew that the doctor wasn't just a normal human being, that there was more there. And of course, the, the solid track wants the knowledge. It wants, you know, it wants to know the stories. It wants to hear about the universe. And that's why the doctor used that used herself as that as that bait of, you know, keep me, let them go, because I've got all these all this stuff I could tell you about the universe. Right. I'd have to watch it again and see what they do. It, my memory is that the points at which the people got force pushed, because these are these are people that have more of a connection or that right. like Hana is the first one to get pushed and she's just been brought in and has just rejected Trina. And that poses a threat to Eric because mm -hmm. Eric is going to take what Hana says more seriously than anybody else in that room. So you got to get rid of Hannah first. Yep. And um and and they may have it structured. People tend to get pushed as soon as they've said something that's a direct threat to the solid track. And right. I'd have to I'd have to rewatch it and see see how that plays out. Um, like when Graham gets pushed, it's because he's just rejected Grace. Right. You know. And so it's like. Now I'm a spurned lover. Of course I'm going to push you. And mm -hmm. so Yaz is Yaz is the only other one who gets pushed. And I'd have to see what they do with her. But at least in the case of Hana and Graham, it's there's a definite rationale for why they would get pushed right. rather than right. the doctor. Right. See, as, as I recall, wasn't Yaz uh, where the doctor said, "Keep send her back and keep me." Basically. Yeah, that that's what it was. It was, uh, you know, the, the doctor had a rationale for for why Yaz should be sent back. You OK, know, I, I, I know she did for it Eric. That Yaz, it wasn't that Yaz spurned. Uh, the the solid solid track. Track. It was yeah. the doctor mm -hmm. saying, you know, only one of us can stay. Keep me. Send her back. Because Eric also finally came to that point where she where he realized who 
Trina yeah. was and rejected yeah, and, her. And, and I liked the bit with, I mean, okay, so my memory is that um, Eric was the last to get pushed because the doctor is the one saying, pick me over him. I, right. You don't want a husband. I'm. You want me because I've got all the knowledge of and space you, you and time. You might be right. I might be misremembering, but and and so she and and I thought that was a very interesting and effective moment where the solid track is betraying its motives here. It's like and think about it from Eric's perspective. I mean, you thought you were back with your wife, and now she's not your wife, and now she's given you the shove so right. she can have a more interesting conversation partner. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so once everybody's gone, the 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 world, the Norwegian world, goes away, and we're in this white world with this very abstract sort of sense of the upper room that they were in, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And the solid track takes the form of a frog that talks like Grace, and I, I, this, yeah, that was weird. I'm sorry, but that was just weird because because the frog the, wasn't I, well done. Yes, that's no. it. I didn't mind the weirdness of it. But that frog was not, its mouth was not well articulated, and it yeah. popped me out of the story to hear Grace's voice coming out of it. I wouldn't have minded a frog that talks like Grace, but it needed to, the visual needed to work, right. and it didn't. Right. It should have been maybe a CGI thing instead of a practical effect, which it looked like it was. Yeah. Um, it looked like, frankly, it looked like something out of, you know, the fourth Doctor's time. <laughs> right, <laughs> with, yeah. With the primitive special effects. Um. And then the doctor talks about being friends with the solid tract. And this is where I was like, is she, is she trying to, does she really want to be friends? Is she trying to make friends? Is it a put mm -hmm. on? Uh, and, and, and that's where I would, would have liked to spend more time developing this, mm -hmm. this part of the story. My sense was that the doctor is, has, is having mixed emotions at this point. I mean, she's just sacrificed herself. she, she may have been hoping the solid track would send her back too, and it didn't. And now she's in this new space and she's saying, she's just reconciling with apparently I just said goodbye to my universe. And now I'm here with you. I'm going to be right. with you forever. And, and I will be your friend. I'm going to make an honest try. And then when it becomes apparent that she can't stay because uh, the destabilizing effect is continuing, mm -hmm. she tells the solid track i even though i won't be here if you send me back i will still be your friend forever right. and and i took that as sincere and when she gets back she says i made a new friend and mm -hmm. so she's kind of at got a lot of mixed emotions i thought understandably but she's trying to do the right thing and, and that includes being a friend even if you can't be together yeah. right um so you know, as the story ends, you know, we, we, we've realizing, so I, I do want to get to the, to Graham and Ryan in a second, but, um, yeah, as the story ends, we're realizing, you know, the moral of the story is, is you have to let go of the past to move on to the future. And the, the idea is what it takes you away. What takes you away? Well, the sense it, it was grief, grief takes yeah. you away from yep. the life you're mm. living. And I like that. I mean, that's a good, I thought message. it was the solid track takes you away. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> or is it Kelgon? Yeah, <laughs> I think in the more literal sense, but I think in the in the uh, in the figurative sense, it was that the grief took Eric away from Hannah, mm -hmm. and it could have taken Graham away from Ryan, and that's the was that nice moment at the end that kind of put the you know the little the little frog in my throat, so to speak, um, a little dust in the eye, uh, you know, where Ryan finally says, "At least we got each other, Granddad," and yeah. what it was yeah. what again, uh, Bradley Walsh his quickly becoming one of my favorites um does it so well you see hit the realization of his face dawning and and that's where the end of course your know, ryan has to kind of like ah, da, 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 you know like try to put yeah. off the emotion but there's that you see that bond has been created uh, I mean, because the thing about ryan feels right now is graham at least got to see nan again yes even if it wasn't really nan and ryan didn't get that so and and he also knows apparently from what Yaz told him that Graham was willing to turn his back on yeah. gr on the Grace illusion to help Ryan. Right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. Uh, so the so that that was a a very nice moment. That was a very good uh, way to, to 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 close it out. So and and that's the real story arc that Chibnall has indicated we're to be looking for in this season. It's the character development. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, so. Uh, any other thoughts uh, that you want to add uh, on this uh, episode? Any things that we had we didn't get? I didn't quite cover. 
Father, you first. No, I don't have anything, so it's all you. So I liked a number of things uh, on the dialogue level. I liked, uh, I liked, the, and on the emotional level, I liked the moment where the doctor was starting to realize that we're dealing with a solid with a solid tract, and she tells, "Yes, I'm scared. I'm genuinely scared. I'm terrified." Yeah, and mm-hmm. and that was nice. Um, I liked when uh, she's talking to a couple of times on the dialogue level when she's talking to Graham about Grace, and she says, "That's not Grace. No offense, Grace." And Grace says, none taken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then later she says, she's, a furniture, she's furniture with a pulse. Right. And I thought that was a nice turn of phrase. Um, I liked how the doctor said, friends help each other face up to their problems, not avoid them. Mm. And I thought that was nice. I liked how we had a reasonable villain, because ultimately the solid track, track concludes the doctor is right. And even though... It's going to make the solid track sad. She does send the doctor back. And I, I thought that was nice to have, a, you know, s- someone who's not just implacably irrational to the last moment. Mm-hmm. You know, it's nice to see that as a resolution for a change. Um, I liked that this was an episode with basically no political overtones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I saw some people online trying to say, oh, there's gender overtones in it, but you know, it, it, nothing substantial. Um, I, I thought th- I thought it was a nice episode. In fact, um, so far, this and Kerblam are my two favorite episodes of the season. Mm-hmm. I like mo- I like horror movies of this type. Recently, I've been um, watching some basically micro budget horror movies where people with only a few thousand dollars go out and make a movie. And I found uh, one. It's called Resolution. That was made by a couple of local San Diego filmmakers in a cabin out in Descanso in, which is this little tiny, tiny place in the mountains outside California. And they just made this whole horror movie in a shack Mm. and um, just with very small cast micro budget. And this made me think of those kinds of movies. I really liked it. And about at the two thirds point, I thought to myself, I may like this better than Kerblam. I think I do. Hmm. Um, (laughs) Interesting. It, I, it, I don't, I'm not, a, I'd, I'd want to watch them both again to, re, you know, just to check that assessment. But I really liked it. I thought it was yeah. really nice. Oh, also, uh, just a flaw, though, that they later tied up. Um, at one point when Ryan is looking in the shed with Yaz and they find the bear traps and it's like, look at all these traps. That's not normal, even for Norway. And I'm going, unless a hunter owns this place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And and then later, well, why all the bear traps? Because there are bears. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, I feel laugh at that one because I, I saw that. It's like, you don't know people who are rural, do you? At least <laughs> yeah. in the United States. I know Norway is very similar to this. Actually, Norway has a, a very strong hunting culture, culture as well mm-hmm. that isn't in the UK quite as strong. But it's like, yeah, I've been to sheds here in Montana that look like that. that that's <laughs> yeah. not that abnormal. Yeah, exactly. All right. Excellent. So thanks for that. Uh, so we have a little bit of feedback on our uh, witch finders Yay. discussion. Uh, Kevin Greenlee says, uh, Jimmy misses something that really bugs me in this episode regarding the King James Bible thing. Yes. Oh, the, yeah. Yes. The New Testament has different emphases than the Old Testament, but love thy neighbor is right there in the Pentateuch. And he quotes Leviticus 19:18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes, absolutely right. You totally got me there. I've uh, the two great commandments, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are both from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Jesus quotes them, he's quoting the Old Testament. I've made that point multiple times in the past, and here it just slipped my mind. Yeah, Jesus even says that this is what the whole Ten Commandments are about, these two. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay. And then, uh, th- so thank you, Kevin, for for pointing that so we could emphasize that. Uh, Les Hammer writes, uh, "Why didn't King James speak King James English?" And my response is, uh, "Because the Tardis were translating." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that just seems to be the for me. The, Verily, the, I I wish the Tardis would take the edge off of some of the accents. They're a little hard to process without <laughs> subtitles. Yeah. Well, the Tardis is translating for them, not for us, unfortunately. Well, I know, but at least for the for the international audience, it could. I wish the Tardis <laughs> would translate a little bit. It may be fine yeah. if you're in England, but elsewhere yes. it can be a little hard. It'd be like the, if the Doctor and his and the companions were were Cajun or you know something like that. Uh. So 
then Danny Butler writes, um, here, here's a link to some of Joy Wilkinson's research. Joy Wilkinson was the uh, screenwriter for The Witchfinders. It's such a witty episode, uh, he says, very Doctor Who. And then uh, he provided a link to a Joy, uh, Joy Wilkinson's Twitter account where, let me see if I can find this again. I was trying to open the link because I forgot to open it before we started recording. But uh, she had a, a whole bunch of books, um, The Wonderful Discovery of Witches by Robert Poole, The Lancashire Witches, Histories and Stories, also edited by Robert Poole, The Demonology by King James, The Pendle Witches book, and The Fate of the Lancashire Witches. So she did, she did some research. Research. Yeah. Unfortunately, one of the problems with a lot of the books you find out there uh, on this topic, they're not written by scholars. Right. And they will repeat myths like ducking stool was used to kill witches and so forth. Right, exactly. Popular books are not the same thing as uh, academic books. Uh, so Danny also asks, is the American history of witch finders the same as the British? I think it's slightly different. Uh, now, I'm no, by no means an expert on this, but I think it's a little I different. I don't think we had witch finders, per se. We had right. witch trials, but right. we didn't have like people appointed to this task. Right, and certainly I think a not, lot of times, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of times it was like the local pastor, you know, Protestant pastor or something like that would kind of take that role. Yeah. 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 And it was more uh, to deal with something that happened in the community as opposed to going and finding them or hunting them down and and rooting them out. Um, He says, uh, the episode takes place in a village haunted by an alien force. Doesn't that change some of the elements of the usual narrative? Uh, And can you always judge historic accuracy to a story that has unreliable narrators? Would King James share intimate details of his life story so easily with a stranger? Would he not just play along and embellish? I mean, those are interesting points. Those are good points. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, that's it for feedback uh, on the witch finders. Uh, we had some others too, I, I, but we don't really have uh, uh, time to, to to do them all. So, but thank you so much for everyone for sending your feedback in. Uh, I want to finish up with just a, a, a another um, plug, if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Advent. We're getting ready for Christmas. Um, people are buying Christmas presents when you're doing your shopping. And if you're shopping online at amazon.com, if you could go to sqpn.com and click on the Amazon link there, um, that will take you to Amazon through, uh, their smile program, which benefits nonprofits like SQPN and a portion of whatever you purchase will benefit SQPN. It doesn't cost you anything extra. It's Amazon donating some of its profits. Uh, they're there. It's their charitable doing good thing. Um, and so, you know, if you could do that, we greatly appreciate it. The, your Amazon affiliate purchases are a substantial portion of our bottom line, frankly. Over the years, uh, listeners have been so generous to to make sure that they did that before shopping. Uh, so if you could do that, especially now where so many people are doing so much shopping, it's a it's a big part of, of what supports us going forward. Um, in addition to your giving at sqpn.com slash give your your pledges and gifts so we we greatly appreciate that we 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 are very grateful to to everyone so with that uh that's it from us on on this episode what did you think of it takes you away and what we had to say about it you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash doctor who or the secrets of doctor who facebook page find the link to this episode there and leave us some feedback or send us an email to doctor who at sqpn.com you can find links to uh, everything to relevant to uh, discussion, our websites, that sort of stuff on our show notes on sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the last uh, episode of this season, barring the New Year's Day episode, which is, it's not considered part of the season. Ah, well, who knows? It's all weird, very weird. It's coming up. <laughs> it's coming up. But it's sort of the penultimate episode. The Battle of, okay, here I'm going to say it, the Battle of Ranscor of Kolos. I Sounds think. Good. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you so much, Don. Father Chorus, Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. <laughs> thank you, Don. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. Right, this is going to be fun. This is Don Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com give.